Hello, everyone. In today's webinar, we are going to be talking about our recent line of credit acquisition, uh, the $50 million deal that we did with BMO and TD. I'm going to talk more about why we did this deal, how this debt financing is good for Hosper, as well as our shareholders. I'm going to be touching on our history of partnerships with different banks and what took us to here. Um, and ultimately, I'm going to talk about all the benefits of this line of credit financing, but also the risks of debt and how we mitigate them. Lastly, we'll end the presentation with a bit about Hosper's proprietary, we call it our Paragon method, and this is how we protect um, our fund from, a, from an investment perspective. And so without further ado, I'm going to jump right in. I will note that we, we actually hosted this webinar with 75 attendees last week, but alas, there was an issue with the recording. Uh, so here I am recording again, take two, uh, and away we go. Um, we can skip me. Hopefully, if you're watching this presentation, you're aware of who I am. And um, today I'm your, your host as the co-founder of Hosper Mortgage. And if you're watching, hopefully you're also aware of what we do. Um, and Hosper's purpose is to be the best alternative to a traditional bank. And so that means we work with investors and borrowers, both providing alternatives from an investment perspective, but also a borrowing perspective. Um, and really the purpose for today's webinar is to give a, a, a bit of time and explanation to this recent headline news that we shared with our client base. Um, so you would have seen in a previous newsletter or press release that we've finally secured a deal uh, for $50 million. And that $50 million is jointly funded by BMO and TD 50-50 uh, or 25-25 uh, in dollar terms. And this was a major milestone for us. This is something that we worked on for uh, started about 11 months ago. So we were working on it for about 10 months. And ultimately, um, this is sort of a milestone for our business, something that we had planned for um, from the inception of Hosper. It was part of our five-year plan. Um, ultimately, we, we achieved this six years into operating the fund. Um, but it didn't happen overnight. I, I want to first start by saying this is not a fundamental radical shift for Hosper, Mick. Um, this is actually the current stage of a, of a culminated growth that we've had with our banking partners. Um, so although this is like the first time we've really announced this as a sort of milestone or, or headline news, um, because it's substantial, um, it's, not, it's not easy for a MIC to obtain this financing and certainly uh, an amount of uh, track record is required. Um, but this is part of a growth that I've illustrated on the, on the screen here. So when Hosper started business in 2016, we opened up our small business bank account with TD. Um, and I, having previous experience working in TD commercial banking, was kind of happy to be on that side of the table. Then as the business grew, we graduated into commercial banking, the role um, that I was familiar with on, on the other side of the desk. Um, and commercial banking offered a lot of other enhancements. You know, now we could do electronic fund transfer. We could debit clients' accounts electronically. We could do process payments electronically. There's a lot of cash management benefits, um, as well as a deeper business relationship with the bank. Um, but ultimately, we were, uh, I don't want to say struggling, but we, we were never given the offer for credit from TD um, while we were given that uh, offer from RBC. And so in 2021, we really decided to switch on the sole basis that RBC had offered us um, a small credit facility, as well as the promise for an increase in the future. Um, and they, of course, had the same basic business uh, banking services, the same electronic fund payments um, that we were familiar with at TD. And so we moved our business to RBC. RBC did sort of offer or promise an increase, uh, but it wasn't happening as fast into the dollar amount they were looking for. Uh, and that's why a year later, we actually, I was actually probably close to 18 months later, but in 2022, we switched to BMO corporate banking, where we were able to obtain a $15 million credit facility. Um, um, and at this time, our collective portfolio was maybe 40 or $50 million. Um, and with that, $15 million line of credit, we began to realize some of the benefits that I'm going to outline um, in, in later in this presentation, specifically the ability to pay down cash as we receive um, lump sum inflows from investors, as well as draw from the line of credit only on, a, on the day that we need to fund the mortgage. So a lot of the cash management benefits started with this $15 million, um, but as the fund AUM grew, uh, 
that 15 million wasn't a large enough for the fluctuations that we anticipate in our business and the day-to-day needs. Um, so we increased the 10 million with just with BMO alone to 25 million. And it was at the beginning or middle of last year that we started the conversation around syndicating with another bank. So bringing another bank into the picture that allows BMO to share the share the deal, but share the risk uh, the same way that we view sharing investments as a way of sharing risk um, with TD Bank. But it also sets us up for further growth because, well, it's not with it's not without reason that it's not unreasonable for BMO to be able to write a $50 million check. Certainly they could do that. But from a future growth perspective, starting the partnership, bringing TD in would allow our next increase to be split. And for example, if we get a $20 million increase in the future, um, well, that's easier for both banks to chip in, pony up $10 million each. And it's, it's a way that we can start our relationship uh, with TD's corporate banking group, as well as maintain our relationship with BMO's corporate banking group. So hopefully that history um, shows that where we've, where we've arrived at today with this $50 million was part of a steady and continuous process. Um, and this is the point we're at in the journey. And hopefully if we continue on our goal to grow the, to grow the MIC, um, we may also see further growth in the line of credit in years to come. And this is where I would first pause and say, it's not lost on me, someone who, who works in mortgages, the, the tremendous power of compound interest for, for an investor or as, as, as the manager of the fund, but also the potential negative uh, power or the potential risk of debt. Um, and I'm sure many of you may have heard the term good debt and bad debt. So commonly, you would consider like a mortgage, good debt, a traditional mortgage specifically, and maybe like consumer loans or credit card debt, bad debt. There's a lot more nuance there, um, but the point is I'm going to try my best to distinguish how debt can both be very positive uh, for some of the reasons listed on the screen, you know, access to capital, obviously, if you want to expand, um, even if you put yourself into you know, in a personal context, someone that wants to buy a house can use good debt to be able to buy a million dollar home when maybe they only have $200,000 saved up as a down payment. That's a, that's a very obvious and simple example of how debt can be positive and beneficial. The same can be for businesses trying to expand or fund managers trying to grow the fund. Um, so certain other things such as, you know, the, the, tax, the tax impact of debt, um, different abilities for us to have uh, flexibility or, or in our world, we call that liquidity to be able to, you know, pay and draw as we need it. Um, and then certainly from a fund perspective, economies of scale. Um, when I then think about the negatives of debt, you know, what comes to mind is basically um, too much leverage. So you may, you may have heard of hedge funds or uh, fund managers who, who lever up 10 times debt, which might mean for every dollar they've got invested, they have $10 borrowed. Um, if you watched um, the recent movie about the GameStop saga, you know, this would have been very obvious with these short sellers who used a tremendous amount of leverage and got in with what is called a short squeeze. So that that happens because you take on too much debt. Um, and that's going to be an important theme throughout the presentation that we want to respect the power of debt um, from both a positive and negative respect. Um, and so when we think of the amount of leverage we're taking on, we're not talking about the you know ten times leverage that hedge funds might use, or you know the five times leverage, or or even the one to one leverage that other mix in Ontario use. One to one would be more than double the type of leverage that we're planning to use. Um, and so right now, the type of lev the type of debt that we've taken on allows for zero point five to one ratio of debt to equity, and in real dollars, that means at, at maximum. Uh, we can borrow one dollar of debt from the bank to go into the mortgage portfolio for every two dollars of equity we raise to shareholders. So again, definitely not the ten to one that we're to, where we might see in other types of hedge funds and investment funds, but at zero point five times to one, which is a responsible amount of debt that will unlock some of the benefits I'm going to highlight. Um, so. Getting into now the purpose of this, I want to be more specific with respect to our two customer groups. So for the audience here uh, and for the 75 folks that were on the webinar last week, I was speaking to our investors. 
you know, we're planning to use this $50 million line of credit to be able to give you more liquidity and have a higher effective return in the fund because of better cash management and a, and a, and a small use of leverage. Um, so ultimately, what I, the words on the screen says, this allows us to have stronger returns. But stronger returns uh, is, is a multitude of things, right? It, it's how we deliver that return. So it could mean the same return, but less risk, or it could mean the same risk, but higher return. And, I'll, and I'm later in the presentation going to show you a chart that will parse out exactly what we're alluding to by that, um, because certainly using leverage increases the risk. But if you can do that while managing a lower risk portfolio of mortgages, it's our belief that that's a, a net win for the fund and its shareholders. Uh, and then the other benefits of the Hosper's business is how, how this plays out for borrowers and brokers. Having this access to up to $50 million of liquidity instantly and not have to pair that with raising money from investors uh, allows us to maintain our offering of really quick and flexible financing solutions. So we commit to fund a million dollar mortgage tomorrow and all of the legal documents are satisfied and all the conditions are satisfied. We don't have to line that up with an investor. We can draw from the available capital we have in the line of credit. We can fund mortgages within 24, 48 hours. And that's a very important offering to our clients who are coming to the private market because they often need a quick alternative to a traditional bank. They often, they need, if, if they struck out with the bank, they need their money yesterday. So being able to close that quickly uh, is a super important competitive advantage for Hosper. And something that if we do, will lead to more good investments we can put in the fund that you can participate into. Um, so now I'm going to start to break down the specific benefits that are unlocked by the line of credit. Um, first, the additional liquidity. So I've alluded to this, but to get specific, right now, if a shareholder was who has, let's say, $200,000 invested in our fund and requests a redemption, there's really three main ways that that redemption can be paid. We could have $200,000 sitting in our bank account. We could then use that to pay the redemption. We could plan for that $200,000 from a potential incoming investor. So let's say we know someone's planning to subscribe $200,000 next month or the month after. We could plan to line that up. Or from the 300 loans in the portfolio, we could plan to set aside some of the proceeds of a payout, not reinvest the full proceeds, but then plan to pay that redemption. Now, the line of credit adds a fourth source. If in that 90-day window, none of those three things were to happen, mind you, that's basically impossible that none of no payouts, incoming investments, or cash available is going to happen within the 90 days. And that's why we've never missed a payout within the 90-day window. But hypothetically, if none of those things were to transpire, we now also have the line of credit that we can pull from to honor that redemption within the 90-day window. That speaks to sort of the additional liquidity on redemption. It also allows us to uphold, or I would even say increase, the quality of loans in the fund. Um, today, the average, uh, the average face rate on a mortgage in the, in the A class is maybe 9 to 9.5%. That allows us to pay out roughly that 9% net of, the, net of the expenses we have to operate the fund. But in the future, as rates begin to decline, it's very conceivable that our ability to price private first mortgages uh, will decline as well. So maybe we have to start pricing deals at 8, 8.5%. 8 but if we want to maintain the yield that you've become accustomed to, one way that we can do that is by continuing to win the higher quality deals by pricing them lower but then using the larger spread on the money we've borrowed from the banks to enhance the return of shareholders. So I won't try to describe that um, more detail here because the very next slide is a chart and we'll get into that a bit more. Uh, the next is a major one. Um, because this is a private fund and, and many of you have met me and you've met the team and you do rely on a level of trust with Hosper as the managers of a private fund. Um, and of course, there's things like, you know, our, our public audits with M&P, uh, there's the third party lawyers we use, the trust companies we work with, there's all those levels of insurance that add assurance. But here's another one. Now you have two brands that you've likely have heard of, um, two financial institutions, conservative financial institutions that act as another, um, 
you know, ombudsman or another another sort of spokes group that's looking after the quality of the fund and making sure that the portfolio remains as strong as possible. So the happier that BMO and TD are with the strengths of our loan book, the better it is for our shareholders as well. Um, we talked about leverage, so I talked about how we can borrow um, up to a certain maximum of debt relative to the amount of money we have from our shareholders. Uh, and that, and I, and I just was starting to explain how we can use the lower cost of borrowing from the banks to make a spread, which we then flow through to the shareholders. So again, that will be illustrated on the next slide. Uh, we talked about faster fundings already. Now, this is super important from our borrowing customer base, but to understand as an investor, the better job we can do to give a good service offer to our borrowers, the, the more variety and quality of deals we have that ultimately you get to invest in. And then lastly, cash management. Uh, when I was talking about the first $15 million facility, this is when we began to, to understand and rely on the importance of sound cash management. When you're managing a, you know, $100 million on mortgages, one day of interest is very material. Thousands of dollars you know, could be saved or you could have opportunity cost of thousands of dollars if you don't you know, manage funds effectively over, it, over an evening or a weekend. Um, so what a line of credit like the one we have allows us to do is to rarely sit on cash in the bank account. Whenever we have cash, it's either going to fund a mortgage that's closing imminently or paid back to pay down our line of credit. And in that way, when, when our law firm, you know, I'm pointing Jeremy Richardson's officer over there, when him or one of his lawyers or clerks tell us the mortgage is ready to close, we don't need to have that cash idle. We can draw it from the line within half an hour uh, to ensure that we can close on time, but we never have funds sitting idle, costing us money, costing us the opportunity cost, right? Um, so we never have to borrow until we're ready to earn an income with that cash. And so that cash management at a scale, a scale in the hundreds of millions of dollars becomes super important uh, in, order to, in, order, in terms of you know, optimizing the performance of a mortgage fund like ours. Um, and this is the chart I'm going to use. Uh, we call it a case study because this is, uh, these are these are numbers that fictionally that I kind of made up just using a whiteboard actually just to illustrate the point. Um, so understanding that will just allow me to, to explain what I'm trying to demonstrate with this case study. And then we'll go to the left side of the screen where I can explain the different levels of risk. That I want you to be aware of, but, but I also want you to understand it. we're mitigating it, how we're mitigating them. Um, so first, let me understand, let me explain how leverage can be used in a mortgage fund. What we've done here is I've described portfolio A, let's call that our no leverage portfolio. Um, that's the, that is a fictitious $10 million portfolio, 10 of which are first mortgages, and 20 of which are second mortgages. The sizes there you can see, those are average loan sizes. Those add up to the $10 million. And in portfolio A, we, for the purposes of illustration, the average loan to value of first mortgages is 75%. And the average loan to value of second mortgage is also 75%. The average return is 9.8%. That's taking a weighted average of the 9% generated by first mortgages and 11% generated by second mortgages. So that's our base study here. Now to, to illustrate how leverage can be used. Now imagine a portfolio where it's the same $10 million portfolio, same breakdown in average loan size in first and seconds, but the difference is $7 million is raised from equity shareholders, like yourself, like a preferred shareholder, and $3 million is borrowed from the bank. Now we're assuming uh, in this case study for, for point of illustration, the cost of the debt is 6%. Okay, this, this is like potentially, if you're, if you're reading the projections um, from the Bank of Canada, maybe it's a year, a year and a half away, okay, or a year away. Um, so what you can see here is actually, we've actually been able to take lower risk deals in portfolio B lower risk represented by the fact that we're charging a lower interest rate, so 8% instead of 9, 10% instead of 11, and we're also taking lower loan to values, 60% instead of 75, 65 instead of 75. 
So what you're seeing is you have a portfolio average loan to value that's gone from 75% to 62%. But wait for it, the shareholder return is actually higher than in the portfolio A. And that's simply because the $3 million that was borrowed at 6% generated an $84,000 spread that is then distributed across the $7 million of equity shareholders. So that, 80, that, that spread or that $84,000 of, of interest spread actually elevates the shareholder return. So I think I'll end it there. There's a lot more nuance we can get into, but the point is if you can use the power of borrowing at a lower rate and then sharing that spread profit with the equity shareholders, it allows you to actually deliver a same or higher return while having lower risk underlying assets as, as like crudely demonstrated by the loan to values here. Okay. So how can it's, it sounds too good to be true almost like what are, what's the catch or how do we, how do we get this? So first of all, a significant amount of, um, a significant amount of underwriting went into into qualifying for this deal. So there was about 20 mix vying for TD to, to be a lender to them. Uh, we were one of two that they selected. So it's not as if they're just banks are going around handing out these types of credit facilities. So that's number one. Um, but also understand they don't offer, they, they offer the lower rate of return, uh, the lower cost of borrowing, excuse me, in their perspective, it's a rate of return that 6% because they have certain privileges. And the biggest privileges is they get to set certain parameters that we must abide by. So for example, they have what's certain called certain uh, debt to equity ratios, which I've already described, which is $1 of debt to $2 of equity. They have certain uh, asset coverage ratios or interest coverage ratios, excuse me. So that would mean we have to prove to them that we can service the debt. The list goes on. There's other requirements that they want to make sure that the that the um, portfolio remains as healthy as possible. So the good news is all of these requirements that the bank's given are to protect the integrity or quality of the loan portfolio. So there's not a lot to be concerned from that perspective because that benefits the shareholders. The one area where the bank is saying, listen, we will give you 6% while your investors make 9 or 10, but we rank in priority. And that needs to be understood. The bank does, bank's debt does rank in priority. And that's one of the ways that we can unlock a lot of these benefits. So I just wanted to make sure that's perfectly clear. Um, but of course, we've done a lot of things to mitigate that risk. If the bank, uh, by only borrowing, let's say, 25 or $30 million against a $100 million portfolio, we've only encumbered ourselves with a little bit of debt relative to the size of the portfolio. Um, I'll use a mortgage example since many of you are mortgage investors and you've done direct mortgage investments. You could think of one-to-one -one leverage, meaning the bank will lend us $1 for every $1 that we have raised from investors as a 100% loan-to-value mortgage deal. Whereas if the bank is lending $1 of debt to $2 of equity, you could think of that as a 50% loan to value deal. And if you've been working in mortgages, you probably know that a 50% loan to value first mortgage would be perceived as a lower risk investment. And so that's the level of debt that we've taken on. Um, and that's the level of debt that TD and, and BMO have decided to, to provide us. Um, and the next risk uh, that, that I have been asked about is what, what happens if the bank calls this debt? So of course, when working with a bank, they're, they're going to tell you, well, everything's going to be fine. And if something happens, we'll work with you. But, um, you know, I, I may only be in my 30s, but I have many advisors that have years and years and years more experience that have shared with me. Um, you always have to plan for the worst and hope for the best. And so that means we need to assume, even though we have a very strong both personal and corporate banking relationship, um, with our bankers, we have to assume that if something changes, the bank may call the debt. And so there's a couple things that we've put in place to protect our shareholders from that happening. Number one, um, it, we do monthly checkpoints with both banking partners, which means we send them a report of our entire loan portfolio on a monthly basis. 
this protects from something happening where if we were only to report on a biannual or annual basis, um, that they, they find something that it makes them extremely uncomfortable. Like they see our portfolio on a monthly basis and we can constantly be in communication about what they like about our portfolio or any constructive suggestions that they may have. Um, nextly, uh, we do semi-annual audits. So we have a third party, which is a requirement as a, as a fund manager, of course, but M&P um, complete very thorough audits where they're verifying everything that we are telling BMO, so they're, they're independently verifying the health of the fund. And this is as strenuous as even not only taking our word for it and independently pulling title, but actually mailing and emailing and calling borrowers on our list saying, are you aware that you have a mortgage from Hosper Mortgage? Are you aware of this company like that? Uh, the amount of times that they actually did that level of sample testing was quite staggering, but quite thorough. Um, and then uh, additionally, we, uh, we've talked about the alignment of interests. I fundamentally believe in business. Um, the more you can align your interests among stakeholder groups or customer groups, you are going to set yourself up for success. And when there's a misalignment, usually that's when there's an issue. So the stronger we maintain our mortgage portfolio, the happier the banks are, the safer our, our clients' investments are, and the more likely Hosper will be around for the long run. So it's a constant process where we're putting you know, the long-term objectives of the fund, slow and steady growth over, you know, quick short-term gains is kind of a, the way I put it. So by constantly putting, by, um, by not so biting off more than we can chew, by not getting ahead of our ski tips and taking on more debt than we need, um, we've really set ourselves up that even in the mm -hmm. unlikely bad scenario of a default, and we talk about this in, you know, mortgage terms on direct mortgage all the time, we have to, when we lend, we have to assume that, Every okay. client may mm -hmm. default, and we have to make sure that we're going to be able to get our money out in the event of that default. That's the same sort of thinking that we've gone into this bank deal with. If you a year later right? were to say, you know what, we're out, we're going back, you're going to have to go back to just working with BMO as a partner, we would be able to pay out our position on that, on that line of credit in a relatively short amount of time. Um, and to get specific on what I mean by that, because all of the mortgages are one-year terms within the fund, um, uh, and then in about terms of 10 the percent of our mortgage like, portfolio pays out every month. Maybe actually, yeah, let's a crude figure, figure, but let's assume that, right? So, okay. if we needed to realize uh, on uh, you know thirty mean, million dollars yeah. out of a hundred million yeah. dollar portfolio, it would take you know at least two to three to four months um, of Thank collecting you know, those payouts, not reinvesting them, What's but setting it aside to pay out either shareholders or to pay out the line of credit. And, and then, as I described, line of credit is paid out in priority. Um, now, lastly, I want to explain like this is one of the huge benefits of operating both a, a MIC business as well as a direct mortgage syndication business simultaneously. Because imagine that scenario where I described where we have to only pay out mortgages to the fund for three months. But Hosper still continues to operate. We still continue to receive new submissions. We still continue to be able to fund deals for our mortgage brokers. Well, that can simply, all of that traffic can be shifted to our direct mortgage program. We can still continue to operate the Hosper mortgage business, so. but, can, but shrink, if you will, the assets in the fund in order to reduce uh, our borrowing or pay, out redemption, or pay out redemption requests. So Can't that's how, we're well positioned that even if we need to unwind this borrowing, we can do so in a relatively short amount of time. And it wouldn't Properties. affect um, the shareholders because the money that's borrowed is directly tied to loans that we've lent. And when those loans paid out, we simply pay back the borrowing. Hopefully I've explained that clear enough. It's just a really, it's a really, it's, I mean, I've had half an hour long conversations with clients on this topic. It's a really important topic to understand, um, but also to, to be, to be clear that we've positioned this in a way that we've mitigated the, the risks um, with respect to this. And then lastly, this is a very fair question. I had not really thought of this until actually two separate clients asked me this. And they said, James, is this is this signaling, this borrowing from banks, is this signaling that you're going to start getting your money from institutional partners and you're no longer going to take the money from you know the families that we've been working with? Is it potential that you prefer to work with $50 million institutional investors as opposed to $50,000 minimum ticket purchasers? The answer to that is a bit yes and a bit no. Um, 
certainly there's no imminent plans for that. We, we've so like, been taking money every affect? 15 days for the last five years, and we intend to continue to do so. Uh, but there is a potential future that we it's we do reach a plateau or we reach a point of saturation where we, as much as we want to raise more money and as much as investors mm -hmm. want to give us more money, it wouldn't be responsible to take it because we don't have certainty that we'll be able to originate enough mortgage volume to be able to put that money to work. So certainly you see this in funds that get to a billion dollars and there I, I have a friend that manages close to 700 million uh close to 700 million dollars in a in a mortgage fund um and they close they've at point points in times closed and reopened redemptions and predominantly closed now because they have enough capital from the banks they have their shareholder base they just they're just doing their best to keep up to keep that money invested and there's no point in taking in money unless you know you can invest it um so there is a potential future where hosper closes one or multiple of our share classes um yes so but what i would say to that that note is certainly the privileges would be grandfathered for existing shareholders so if we're ever at that decision point of should we close should we not close um it would be it would be very likely that we would allow incremental investments from existing shareholders and first to close off investment to new investors so that would be kind of one of this one of the benefits inherent in being an existing or, or certain it's a way of i guess showing gratitude or appreciation for our long time shareholders for the ones that helped us to, to start to build the the fund to be able to give them um additional contribution privileges at a later date um, and lastly um you know no no mortgage fund will ever be 100 percent debt funded right so there will always be a component of shareholder investment um, as as Hosper has grown, as we've grown in both the number of staff, but and hopefully that case study was helpful to illustrate the benefits that come with this kind of borrowing. Um, now I'm going to pivot. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our history. So okay, we have this track record basis built, right? The, the thesis is there. Now we branched off the A class. The, the A class was was the balance fund that remains the, the largest in the, the middle of the three. And then we added on one end a low risk fund, which we call our comfort fund, and on the other end a high yield fund, which we call our high yield fund. And so that basically brought in the offering to three. Okay, of course, across all three funds, as you know, residential mortgages just in Ontario, loans up to a million, but now we have three buckets that you can invest into. So if you look, uh, the money. dates are around February, where look, there looks to be there's a decline in the portfolio, which which would be reasonable, a reasonable guess to say, oh, we, the, people must have been redeeming or money must have been coming out, assets must have been coming out of the portfolio. But what happened in February is we had more payouts and a bottleneck of Several million dollars of closings that these, didn't happen in February. They were scheduled to happen. They got pushed into March. Like so what you see yeah, here so this is graphically cool. is a visual representation of us yeah, taking right. mortgage payouts. We have a pipeline of deals that wants to be oh, funded. There's no point in sitting on that cash in the portfolio, right? So we paid down the line of credit. So the overall AUM shrunk, but... I don't like then, how... as you see by the graph, right? Then certainly, like, because there's a uh, difficult to time these. Then in March, all of those deals that were going to close in March, anyways, closed in, in quick succession, like, and we're able to quickly and rapidly draw from that line of credit that we've paid down, and then some to fund a busy March. So you can see how we can use that line of credit to fluctuate with the steady growth over the long term, right? Um, no, so I think that's all I want to share on that on that topic. Um, okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna use my favorite question, um, and I'm gonna use something that we call the Paragon method. As we've been calling this Paragon method internally, as sort of like how we Hosper do things differently. To answer my favorite question that came out of the out of the uh, webinar. So the question went along something like this: uh, How does Hosper? Uh, protect its assets in the event of default. And so to use the Paragon method to describe that, um, this scary. is the outer ring oh, that you wow. see is our pre-closing oh, risk mitigation. Should, so uh, these are the things that we do before we've agreed to do a deal or before we Wait, fund the mortgage. Wait, is this not level? First has to do with underwriting and legal deals. Oh, so from an underwriting perspective, 
The yeah. scrutiny is heavily on the property. And we, of course, have a certain criteria required for the appraisers. We have to know the appraiser. We, have, we don't accept appraisers from anybody. We've, we've reviewed the appraisers for rationality, making sure that they're consistent with the thousands of other appraisers that we're going to look at that okay. month. Um, and we also look at the borrower situation. We consider the affordability of that mortgage and their exit plan. That's what we hosper do to decide if we hosper are comfortable lending on a deal. And I would mention this is an important point. We only do deals we would put our own money in ourselves. We only do deals that we would be comfortable being the ones to fund it ourselves. And I'm now talking just about our personal capital. Uh, alas, we do not have $300 million of our personal capital. How nice would it be if we did? Um, but if we did, we wouldn't have these great direct mortgage programs and this MIC program where we can share these opportunities with our investors. But that's an important point because if a deal we underwrite doesn't oh, fit the MIC, and we don't find a direct investor in time, we are going to fund it ourselves. So that's the base layer for, from an underwriting perspective. And then we pass it off to our partners in the, I'm, I'm, I'm alluding to the, across the hall because that's where uh, Richardson Law's office is, where they begin their legal due diligence. These are all the things to, to verify that the borrower who says they are who they are and says they owe what they owe, it's confirmed, right? And that's done from a, a legal due diligence perspective. Now. After that, now we're getting into the green in a ring. This is post-closing. These are the things that Hosper does, and that this is like almost where like a little bit of elbow grease comes into play. It's not just about predictions and, and the numbers. This is where we can actually affect the outcome of a mortgage even after something has happened, like a, like a default. Um, so loan servicing is hopefully mitigating the number of defaults. This is our ability to correspond and communicate with borrowers, to investigate, to create problem solving, uh, to communicate with them on a, on a level where they don't feel it's confrontational, where we are truly trying to help them in their problem. Um, but then ultimately that's not enough. Sometimes there is people who have life events in the middle of a mortgage and that it impairs their ability to continue to pay. And if that happens, we do have to carry out the power of sale process from time to time. And this is the same legal process that a bank would use if you were to default on a bank mortgage. But what we learned is that going through that process, often the asset you're left with is in some form of disrepair. So sometimes there's been parts of the home that are neglected, you know, even grass, you know, landscape has been neglected. That would be very common. So we've built a partnership with companies, one specific company actually that's, that's done most of the deals in the last year uh, called Casafix, which comes in com completely quickly and cost effectively rehabilitates the property to a point now where when we sell it and we list it, it's not only appealing to real estate investors, but it's move in ready. You know, I call it like IKEA grade finishes. It's not, you know, granite counter or you know, marble countertops and like like luxury finishes, but it is absolutely quality enough for a family to move in and for a bank to give them a mortgage on that property. And then lastly, property sale. This is another area of the equity stack that we can protect because if we can control the sale of the property and we can work with a realtor who will be able to control the cost that they will take. In other words, if we're at a potential loss, they'll sell for 1% or less. That allows to protect the remaining equity in a property. And we've built out a network of these realtors as well as internal realtors that are part of Hosper's team that allow us to sell the property and protect as much of the equity as possible. So kind of between those pre-funding and post-funding layers, these are different layers that we can do to mitigate risk and protect mortgage investments from loss. Um, and so that, thanks for letting me share a little bit about the Paragon. We kind of call it, I don't remember internally how we got the name Paragon. We've been calling it this for the last couple of years. Now we figured we, you know, might as well explain exactly to our clients what it is that we do differently um, when lending on these type of mortgage investments. So folks, uh, you know, that's it for me. There was five or six more questions that were asked that we we're going to record and post separate video responses to. We're going to break them up into bite-sized uh, clips and post them on our YouTube channel. And thanks so much for tuning in. And I hope uh, this gave you a fuller understanding as to the growth of Hosper to date, why we've chose to partner with these two banks, and the benefit that this line of credit will have for us as a business, as well as you as a shareholder. Have a very good day. Bye now.